thank you so much for being here. Um, as Julie said, I'm going to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes. We'll have a period of time for questions, but I do want to save five minutes at the end to do some acknowledgments and say some thank yous to some of the people in the room and some people not in the room. Um, so let's try to wrap up by about five till so I can have time for that. I'm going to be, you're going to be hearing a lot from me today, um, and we're going to talk a lot about the Ebola epidemic in Liberia in 2014. And so before we hear exhaustively from me, I want to respectfully hand the mic over to um, a Liberian. He's an Ebola survivor. His name is Dominic. And this is a young man that we met, Lily and I, in um, outside of Monrovia at the Armed Forces of Liberia headquarters. And he told us a little bit about his experience. I just want to take two minutes to... She was in Ghana when she came down for a rebellion. It's where she got affected from. I'm calling my mom and dad, my older sister, and got affected from the on the rebellion. When we when we went home after a few days, we started showing signs and symptoms of Korea. So a lot of problems on the mother that. Your mom, the sure said you would come over. I was a bit afraid to even enter the house. I stood at the door. And then my grandma like, you know what, I told you She said that, uh, it's like, uh, a witch, or uh, someone, or something, and gave my mom to do it. So it was something else, but she put her, and she didn't be afraid. I went in, I talked to her, and then she was afraid to reach the end of her facility. So I thought it was the wrong thing that I'm doing. The best thing now, if you get to a facility, if you have been tested, if you are negative, you can do that certificate and go anywhere for better treatment. But for now, stay in the Everyone will be at risk. And if you, you don't have the virus, people will be afraid. They will come around. So you need to step up and get to the top of the um, Julia is asking that we share our screens through Zoom. So let me just come back here and press the share screen button. Oh, which one do I want? Desktop one? Okay, so hopefully that'll do it. Okay, so not only do we have a, a more uh, personal perspective here on the ground in what's going on in Liberia during the Ebola epidemic, um, but Dominic also made a few key points that I want to um, touch on. He said his mother was, um, uh oh, I can't see my notes. <laughs> his mother was infected at the funeral of his uncle. And that's something that's a common theme that we saw during that epidemic. He also said that. Um, he himself was infected with Ebola when he came into contact with his mother. And his grandmother told him that it was safe to, to do that because what she had was not Ebola. It was a poison drink that um, came from a witch. He did not need to wear any protection to see his mother, and he did not need to stay away. Also, his mother was afraid to go to the health facility, and he had to convince her to do that. And so there's an issue here of perhaps some lack of trust on her part as to what would have happened if she had presented at the hospital. Okay, so these are things to come back to, but I just wanted to share that with you guys. So here's a quick outline. Nope. Okay, 
Um, so we're going to go through some theory. I want to build a bit of a hanger for you, a structure, um, so that we can all get on the same page about how I view these sorts of systems. I want to take basic tenets of epidemiology, build a kind of complex system perspective on it so that we can um, understand where my dissertation, where my work is placed in there. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Ebola, what happened during the epidemic. We're going to look at the three projects I did. We're going to wrap up with some discussion points. And then we'll go to questions and acknowledgments. OK, so one of the first things that we want to know about epidemics is how many people are sick? And what is the trajectory of that particular number? You might think of it an analogously to, let's say, a rocket. Let's, we fire a rocket in the air. We might know its uh, altitude. Say it's up, oh, it's up 1,500 feet. Well, almost as important as where it is, is where it is going. So what is the velocity at which it is traveling upwards? And what are the um, acceleration uh, forces that are bringing it back down or sending it back out? And so um, in order to get at where the number is going, we use this figure R0. This becomes a very important epidemiological number. Um, what it means is how many infected people each infected person um, causes in a completely susceptible population. So if the number is, say, two, then one person would cause two knock-on um, uh, infections. And then from there, you would get four and eight and so on in a doubling process like that. Not exactly true, of course, because um, you will eventually infect so many people that you can't sustain that level of growth. But that's the basic idea. I was going to have um, Kate Winslet introduce this because in Contagion, uh, the movie Contagion, she plays a CDC epidemiologist and she explains R0 in this particular scene. But she makes a couple of mistakes. And so rather than con <laughs> confusing you, um, and then and Jamie would would obviously stand up in anger when he heard her call it a rate. That this this is this angers him greatly. Um, and rather than correcting that, I will I'll introduce it. But I just wanted to point this out. It's it's actually an important point because um, this really shows us that like, the movie makers wanted to know okay what is the most important scientific thing we can we can put in here. And clearly someone said it's R not. This is this is the biggest um, most important thing you can do. OK, so what do we know about R0 sort of more qualitatively? What does it mean? Another way to think about it is that it's the number of, let's take one infected person and ask how many contacts you have in a particular day. And let's define that contact, let's say, as a hug or something more, uh, more intimate. So how many people do you hug in a day? And given that you've hugged someone, what is the probability that you would transmit an infection? And then how many days are you infectious for? And if you multiply these things together, you roughly get the number of people each infected person would, would then cause. One of the issues that this causes um, for us is that we, we typically think of this number as a static parameter. We tend to think of each um, R0 value as being ascribed to a disease system without the possibility of any kind of dynamic quality. And so what this, this leads to is uh, is framing it in a narrative of um, we are going up with a particular acceleration and nothing is going to bring us uh, back down unless we as a community do something about it. So that's sort of the, uh, the um, motivation behind this study. This is a CDC model that came out um, in the middle of the Ebola epidemic. I was trying to project forward what was going to happen in the future. And so what they did is the black line, they said, we're going to have 1.4 million cases of Ebola in Sierra Leone and Liberia by January of 2015 if we don't see significant changes in the intervention. What actually happened is in the red dots there. Um, and this is, this is a plot that Jamie made. This is cleverly done with a, uh, the y-axis is actually a, a log plot here. So what if we make it a linear plot? It looks something like that. So what you can see is that um, this prediction was extremely far over what really happened. I think it's a useful thing to do because it shows us something of an upper bound and a warning. It says this could get way out of control if, if something's not changed. So it's not a terrible thing to do, but it doesn't accurately predict what happened. We have um, Barack Obama address the United Nations in, uh, on September 25th, 2014. And he said something similar. He said, um, if we don't act now, and we don't do something really big, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of people infected with Ebola in a couple months, and we're going to have a destabilized region. And so this was a major crisis at the time. Um, but they framed it in this way of 
it's going to grow out of control unless we, as an international community, exogenously do something, come into the system and force things to change. OK. However, if you look back at this framing, you can see that R0 has a lot of social characteristics um, that make up these parameters. So how many contacts you have per day, it's not actually a biological certainty. You can choose that. You can choose to stay home from church. You can also choose not to hug someone. You can choose to wear um, gloves and wash your hands, and that might actually reduce the transmissibility. You can isolate someone who's sick and take them out of the system and then, then effectively reduce their duration of infectiousness. So there are a lot of things that you can do, and you might be inspired to do that if you were afraid of um, becoming infected. OK, so I got really interested in this early on at Stanford, and um, specifically behavior and behavior change. Um, how important is it relative to the idea of exogenously coming into the system, as um, Barack Obama um, suggested we do? Um, what are those two things? How do those interplay? How do they kind of combine to stop an epidemic? And then how does it work? What inspires people to change their behavior? Um, we, we gather it must be something about being afraid. Um, or maybe you could frame it economically, like you have some kind of economic incentive to change your behavior. Um, but that's something that I started to get interested into and um, look into. OK, another basic tenet of epidemiology is the epidemiologic triad. So this says, how does someone get sick? Well, you have your host, your human being, perhaps, and an agent, maybe Ebola or some other pathogen. And these two things come in together in space and time, transmission. Um, this is a really useful way to frame this because it's dead simple. It's really easy to understand. And um, for a physician who's looking at an individual, um, it's completely appropriate. The issue is that it's somewhat reductionist in that there may be some um, scales at which you look at a group of sick individuals, and this sort of thinking doesn't help us understand the system. So I have a quote here from um, Phil Anderson, who's a physicist, and he's talking about physics when he says this, um, but I think it's I think it applies here. He says this. Uh, can I? Maybe I can get it back. Yeah, great. The hypothesis breaks down when confronted with the twin difficulties of scale and complexity. The behavior of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles, it turns out, is not to be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear. And the understanding of the new behaviors requires research. So this may work for an individual, but you can't simply aggregate this up and totally understand things. Um, here's another. Here's another way of looking at it that's more specifically about epidemiology. This is Anthony McMichael in the mid-90s who says, epidemiology is oriented to explaining and quantifying the bobbing of corks on the surface waters while largely disregarding the stronger undercurrents that determine where, on average, the cluster of corks ends up along the shoreline of risk. So rather than um, focusing too much on the individual corks, we want to understand the currents of water that are pushing the corks around. So that's basic systems thinking um, to orient uh, this, this sort of way of thinking about infectious disease systems. So rather than maybe the agent and host in the environment, you might have a social system that is itself complex, transmission system that has nonlinear dynamics, and an ecological system that also has complex components. And these things are actually interacting with one another. And so you start to see that we are looking at a complex system of complex systems, and that leads to a lot of um, difficulty in completely understanding and quantifying everything. This, the interactions of the system can lead to unpredictable dynamics and emergent properties and phenomena. And so it's rather understandable that we might ha have a lot of difficulty predicting forward an epidemic in, let's say, mid the middle of 2014 that the CDC did with Ebola. I don't think I would have done any better. I didn't know where this thing was going um, because there's just so many things at play. It was really difficult to predict. Great. OK, so coming back to behavior and how behavior changes, um, we know that behavior affects epidemics. We looked at that with the R0 description. People who have levers that they can kind of pull on with the C and the tau and the D that they can 
reduce r naught through their social choices. We also know that epidemics inspire behavior changes. We see that with condom sales um, in uh, HIV prevalent communities um, will go up. And when the HIV prevalence um, is low, um, you'll, see, you'll see condom sales being low. And so there's a response there to prevalence. And that happens in a number of systems. Also, vaccination choices. Turns out that when there's a lot of measles going around, people vaccinate their children more. Who knew? OK, and then I'm also interested in what is the, what is the relative responsibility of this intervention aspect. So it's not just behavior going on. We also have really important exogenous forces that are coming into the epidemic system, and they're acting on it. Um, doctors, personnel, military, military people, and um, treatment clinics, vaccines, and so on. There's, there's all sorts of things that people do. OK, to complicate things a little bit, what I want to know is what's going on with behavior change? What inspires behavior? And I want to break it up into this intervention, international government community that's acting on the epidemic exogenously. I want to know how that's affecting people's behavior. And I also want to know how the epidemic is affecting people's behavior. So I'm breaking this down into components of fear and components of trust. And I want to stress, I'm also um, dividing the intervention bubble into an international community and a national government community because these two bodies are looked at very differently. I want to stress that this is not an accurate depiction of the system because there's so much more that's going on. Um, if, I don't know if any of you have been in EIPER brainstorming sessions where you put up bubbles with arrows. But what inevitably happens is that somebody says, you missed a bubble. And then you spend 45 minutes listing the bubbles. You're like, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about the economy. That's really important. Oh, and the politics and the corruption, like that's a big deal too. And then before you know it, you have 35 bubbles and counting, and there's, there's, you know, you don't know what to do with your big complex system. So what I'm going to do is leave it at this. I'm not going to add more bubbles, though. I know that we're all tempted to raise our hands and say I missed something. Um, and I'm going to think of some approaches we can take to studying this because it's getting a bit nasty. This is this is hard to study this system as a whole already, and we ha we don't even have all the bubbles we'd like. So what are some approaches we could take? Well, first of all, you can simplify this system. You can say, I want to look at one phenomenological interdependency between two bubbles. There's a feedback mechanism. I want to look at that. And you isolate that. You take that, simplify it to just that, you cut out all the excess, and you, you study what, what's going on with those. That's not going to help you necessarily predict things precisely, but it will help you understand what might be going on. Another thing you can do is simulate. You could say, OK, give me all the bubbles, all of them, and then let's measure as many as we can and try to understand exactly what's going on. And if we did that, let's say, with the Ebola CDC model, we might get a better precise prediction. The issue is that we'd have so many bubbles, we'd overfit our model. And in the next epidemic, we'd have different contexts. And then our model isn't worth much. So while I think that's really good strategy for climate change, when you have one trial and you have a lot of information and you really want to get it right, I don't think it works for epidemics, um, at least not for Ebola. OK, um, what about uh, focusing? So this is where you would take just one arrow and you'd say, I want to I understand how this affects that. And I want to impress upon the academic community that this is important. And I want to contribute that little bit. And so what I've done in this dissertation is um, a simplifying model, looking at uh, complex dynamics. And then I've focused onto one arrow. And I want to look at trust specifically. And I will tell you why. So let's talk a little bit about Ebola and why trust was so important. Here's a picture. Um, Ebola is a, a virus. There, it was first discovered in 1976 um, after an outbreak in Zaire, what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There have been many outbreaks and epidemics of Ebola. Technically speaking, this is the genus of Ebola, not Ebola Ebola. And so there is a Sudan Ebola virus and a Bundabugio Ebola virus depicted here. But for, for this audience, we can just say this, these are all the outbreaks of Ebola. Until 2013, and up at the very top left here, you have um, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. There was a new outbreak of Ebola when a little boy was infected in December 2013. By the middle of 2014, the outbreak had spread to three different West African capitals, Freetown, Conakry, and Monrovia. And it was um, 
running rampant and everyone was highly concerned. I think everyone in this room probably remembers hearing about Ebola at the time and reading news articles and thinking, oh, oh no, like this is not only a major humanitarian crisis in Africa, this is potentially the end of the world, right? And I think you might have remembered some of that. Um, what, so what happened in West Africa? Well, there was a lot of fear. That's very characteristic of Ebola, primarily because it has a really high case fatality rate. It's really scary. If you get Ebola, you have a very high chance of dying, even if you go to a health facility and get treatment, because there wasn't much treatment available at the time. So this leads to issues of mistrust and fear, because even if you send your family member to the hospital, which is what we'd like you to do, they might not come back. So we had a lot of fear. We had um, a health working a health worker team in Guinea was was actually killed by um, one community that they were trying to help because they were afraid of what they were trying to do. We had um, we had one um, one instance of a raid on an Ebola treatment clinic in a slum in Monrovia where people tried to rescue their family members from that Ebola treatment clinic. The government re responded violently by putting down this um, little raid and then violently enforcing a quarantine of the entire slum. We had a um, Liberian newspaper publishing some rumors and conspiracies that were not helpful. One of the things they said was that the government was sending people out to poison the wells of different communities with Ebola, and this is one of the major causes. And actually, in some of our subsequent work, we found that rumor over all of the three communities. So. I don't know if it's originally from that newspaper article, um, but we did see that rumor come up again. So there's a really impressively prescient editorial put out in The Lancet in June of 2014 that said, this is a major crisis. June of 2014, by the way, is probably before you read things in the news, um, even though things were, were getting quite bad already, um, that said, in order to stop this, we're going to need to establish more trust and confidence in local communities because that is extremely important to our efforts. And so this, this narrative runs a little bit in contrast to the one that says, um, we need to send in the troops. We need to send the cavalry, pour the money in, and we're going to solve this issue as the international community. This editorial is saying, wait, we have a trust issue. People aren't going to comply with our, with our recommendations. People aren't going to do these things unless they trust in us and our ability to help them. Um, so I really agree with that, and that's the reason I decided to focus on trust. So let's get into some of the work. Remember, this is our schematic. What do we already know about trust? What have people already done? Um, turns out not a ton. This is sort of an interdisciplinary issue. You could look at this as an economist, but even if you were an economist, um, and you had all that economist confidence that they, that they tend to have, um, you might not be very confident that you were within the realms of economics, you know, trust, that seems kind of like, oh, I guess, you know, but trust the government with health, you know, you start to feel like you're outside of the realm of economics. Similarly with psychology, you might be confident on the individual level, but you might not really know what's going on with the government. government. I read one paper that was a political science perspective on this, and, um, and that didn't seem to kind of appreciate some of the, the uh, health intricacies of it. But there are some things that we have studied and we do know. So what do we know? Um, one study cross-sectionally linked higher levels of trust to higher levels of compliance, which is really important. That was one of the things I actually wanted to do. Um, so darn it, they did it. Um, that's OK. There are a lot of other subjects here that are important that we can study. Um, so they, they, they showed that if you have more trust, you are more likely to comply with the health recommendations. That's a big one. Higher incidence communities had higher levels of knowledge and higher levels of, of adopting important Ebola practices. So in a community that has a lot of Ebola, we see people know more about Ebola. Maybe because we put in a lot of efforts to disseminate information in uh, risky areas, but we don't know why they, they, that's true. We also had a bunch of focus group discussion studies that went out into the community, got qualitative information, asked people, talked to people qualitatively, um, because they really wanted to know why are we seeing so much healthcare avoidance. This is a really big deal um, during the epidemic. People were not calling the Ebola hotline. They were not. Um, they were not using the resources 
that um, were available to them. Um, and so one study put out by the uh, by CDC um, anthropologists in Liberia um, looked closely at that. Why are people so afraid of, of cremation um, and changing burial practices? Okay, what we still don't know though is what happened to trust during the epidemic? This is really hard to get at because it's a, a bit um, fuzzy as to how you might go about doing this. But we'd really like to know what happened dynamically to trust over time during the course of the epidemic, and then what affects those things? So what's driving these levels of trust and what's driving these changing levels of trust? Okay, so we set out to look at that. Um, we set up a household survey in three different communities in Liberia. Um, almost a total of 1,500 people. And these three communities have a very different experience during Ebola. So here are the three communities. They look very close together on a map, but in fact, um, their experiences during Ebola were very different. This is Duazon. This is um, on the main road, and there is just one main road. It, it's paved, it goes from city of Monrovia to the airport, and this is a very central road. So all these communities are built around this road. Um, this one in particular, in Duwazon, there were no active cases of Ebola here, but this community was located between the airport and the capital, and between um, major hospital, JFK hospital, and the crematoria that they were using to um, burn the bodies of Ebola victims. And so this community would have seen a lot of activity. They would have seen a lot of ambulances go by, foreign personnel that were entering the country would come through um, on this road. And so they would have seen quite a lot going on even if they didn't have active cases in the community. So um, a little bit away from the road, it looks a bit more like this. And this is the road itself near Duwazon. Second community was Carysburg. The little red dots, by the way, are GPS points from households where we did our surveys. Carysburg is located at a higher altitude up in the mountains. It is a little bit more rural. It is, um, it, houses are a little more spaced uh, apart. It's not quite as, as, as dense. Um, and there were no Ebola cases here. And when we asked permission from the mayor to, to study here, she told us that she had actually informally established a quarantine of this town. She didn't let anyone in or out during the epidemic. Um, and if people left, um, they weren't allowed back in. Tubmanburg was a city in the west, is a city in the west of Liberia, the capital of Bomi County. Um, this is a much more urban area, although by Liberian standards, that's not that dense. Um, there were 250 suspected or confirmed cases of Ebola, um, suspected and confirmed cases of Ebola during the epidemic in this community. So they had active cases of Ebola, and we expect that that might have some kind of influence on, on some of these um, things that we're going to be measuring. On the left side of the map here, you have an ETU that was established by the Americans in late 2014. So this is what near the center of Tubmanburg looks like. Okay, so what did we do? We, we asked people about their levels of trust in the Liberian government and their level of trust in um, international non-governmental organizations over the course of the epidemic retrospectively to try to understand how these things changed over time. So we asked them at different fi uh, five different time periods. Over those time periods, we established boundaries, events, that were um, to help people remember specific events that happened over the course of the epidemic. And then we asked about time periods between those specific sort of flag points. This was to um, reduce recall bias. So we, we're not just asking, oh, March of 2014, we're asking between this event and that next event. Next, we uh, measured a lot of potential explanatory variables so we could generate some hypotheses about what might be going on with trust. So we measured social capital by asking um, people a set of, of resource generator questions. Things like, do you have access to a motorbike, say? Um, if you don't, does someone in your family? If no one in your family does, does an acquaintance? Um, and this, this gets at what sort of resources do you have access to? And then we aggregated those answers to get a, an index score for social capital. We asked a series of other questions. Do you believe that Ebola is uh, real? Uh, what's your age, gender, religion, community? Um, we asked people a true-false quiz about Ebola to, to score their level of knowledge. Um, do you personally know someone infected? What's the household size? And so on. 
Okay, this is, these are the results. Um, we see this is the distribution of the entire sample population's um, social capital index scores, roughly normally distributed. Um, but what's important here is that, interestingly, in the communities, there were significantly different social capital scores. Duazon, the town between the hospital and the crematorium, had a higher social capital score than did Carysburg, town in the mountains, which had a higher social capital score than did Tubmanburg, the city with active Ebola. These are the results from the knowledge about Ebola. Um, generally, people got things right, so more than 50% on every, on every question. Um, still, there are some interesting things, like 77% of people said that Ebola was not caused by witchcraft. Conversely, 23% said that it was. I don't know what to make of that, but that's, that seems like a high number. Um, so we took these as our explanatory variables, and we looked at the results. Here, here are the, the um, output results uh, for trust. And we looked at people's level of trust in NGOs and their level of trust in um, the government. And we looked at those distributions over time. So one of the things that seems pretty clear from this is that the trust in NGOs was higher than the level of trust in the government over all five time periods. And that maybe something is going on um, dynamically. Maybe the ch this trust levels are um, changing significantly. So the way we got at that was take one individual Take their level of trust at time period two, subtract their level of trust at time period one to look at the difference, and do that for all the time periods. So when we do that, we see that there's a significant decrease in level of trust for the government um, at, at all time periods, and most dramatically in the third time period during the, during the peak of the epidemic. For NGOs, there's not a significant um, level of change um, for the first three, t uh, second, third, and fourth time period, but there is for the fifth time period, which seems to be an increase in trust at the end of the epidemic. Okay, so we took the third time period distribution here as our outcome variable of interest for a um, generalized linear model, and the fifth time period here to understand what are the what's driving those those major changes. Um, so for the trust in the government. Um, we, we ran a generalized linear model, and then we did a backward stepwise regression to get uh, the best subset um, of uh, explanatory variables. And the most significant um, finding here was that with a fairly large effect size, the residents of Tubmanburg uh, expressed a greater decrease in trust than did um, uh, residents of the other two communities. For trust in NGOs, similarly, Tubmanburg um, had a higher level of decrease in trust for NGOs, um, but the effect size was much smaller. We also had a significant effect for true-false scores and believing Ebola is real, but similarly small effect sizes. Okay, so what are some conclusions from this? Well, we see that trust um, did not remain static throughout the epidemic, that it um, changed um, significantly. There's a higher level of level of trust in NGOs, and that in the high Ebola incidence location, there was a greater trust decrease. And so we might try to um, hypothesize why that might be. Um, interestingly, while the social capital scores were lower in, in this location, um, that social capital scores did not come out as a significant driver. So maybe something else is going on. Maybe it has something to do with the Ebola epidemic itself, or maybe response control efforts and so on. Okay, so another strategy we might look at to understand what's going on here is qualitatively go in and ask people and talk to people. So that's what we did. We established, uh, we set up nine focus group discussions, talked to a bunch of people. What do we know already qualitatively about trust um, qualitatively during uh, Ebola? Um, without pro uh, trust, proper health behavior changes would not be followed. We saw that low levels of trust led to lower levels of compliance. And we also see that fear and resistance to care, to accessing Ebola treatment units, and to cremation um, was caused by misinformation, denial, and low levels of trust. What we still don't know is what happened to, what, what has happened to trust since the end of the epidemic? And the reason why we might be interested in something like that is because if we believe that the beliefs and levels of trust were important during the epidemic. If, if something were like Ebola were to happen again, 
what would we be likely to see? And so um, has trust been restored, for example? Have the rumors been dispelled? Do people believe Ebola is real now in general? Um, what do people think were the causes of Ebola now? So we did nine focus groups. In each of the three locations, we did three focus groups, um, one of all adult women, one all adult men, and uh, one of mixed uh, youth. I'm going to speed up a little bit here, I think. Um, so what are some of the things that we we found by talking to people about this? Um, there was a, a large amount of fear reported, negative psychological effects um, from the epidemic, things like lack of sleep, isolation from friends and family, wanting to run away, inability to eat, stigma. Um, what did people say about trust in government? Most participants reported that they did not trust the government during Ebola. And further, that the government had misused Ebola money. So one person said, we heard it on the radio that the government stole the Ebola money. The Ebola survivors were supposed to be surviving from the Ebola money, but it not, it's not happening anymore. Someone else said, in this country, people were dying. Then you taking money from different countries, putting it in your pocket, and not seeking the people's interests. Some people got rich out of this sickness, so don't trust them. Conversely, reports on trust in NGOs was higher. People said, said things like, um, that, there was, that the um, NGOs had no business coming here, but they did because they care about us. And so what we see from that is there's sort of a, a discrepancy in perceived incentives. The government is seen as getting money from Ebola, and therefore perhaps they're um, you know, corruptly incentivized to cause the epidemic in, in some cases, or according to some people, um, or to prolong it. But the NGOs did not have that sort of um, corrupt incentive issue. People were, it, they were more perceived as benevolent actors that um, didn't need to be there, but they were there because they wanted to help. Okay. Other results, um, is Ebola real? People reported a lot of denial at first during the epidemic. But they said that personally witnessing Ebola um, led them to be, become more convinced. However, in all three communities, some respondents said that Ebola was not real. And some of the reasons for that said, well, nobody in our community died. So I don't think it's real. Some people said it was a conspiracy. It was created by the government. Um, other people said the symptoms that were reported um, were from Ebola are still present in the community today. So if you have, say, malaria, you, you have some of the same symptoms. And they reason that that means if those symptoms are still here, then that's not Ebola. Or, then Ebola never existed in the first place. OK, some of the causes. Uh, I'm gonna have to wrap up. So let me let me go. Th let me just move through these. Some of the main points from this study is that behaviors mostly reverted to what they were before the epidemic, but in some cases they're still there. Hand washing is is um, greater now than it was beforehand. Um, denial of Ebola still exists. Causes of Ebola are still in disagreement with some of the scientific consensus in many cases. General distrust of the government because of perceived incentives and general trust of NGOs because of other perceived incentives. Um, OK, so I'm going to have to kind of get through this a little quickly. Our third study is about simplifying. right? We're going to look, we're going to um, isolate two of the variables and look at their interdependencies. How we did this was we looked at an SIS model. S stands for susceptible, I for infected. This is a standard uh, kind of model. You look at um, the interaction between susceptible people and infected people and with some, um, with some amount of interaction um, multiplied by parameter, you will see S's become infected. And this is a very typical kind of model. So how do we want to introduce dynamic behavior change into this? Um, the key is through this B parameter. What we can do is say um, that that parameter that moderates how often the contact between S's and I's be, uh, leads to transmission um, we can introduce a contact that people choose at each at each time period, and then that can dynamically depend on their um, that their cho their choices and their perceived level of risk. Okay, so what this looks like is a utility function, and this is a lot of math. But what I want you to understand is that it's it's about trade-offs. So you could have more contacts, let's say, um, or you could have a certain degree of contacts and get some utility out of that. You go to the market. Um, maybe you meet your friends, and that gives you some amount of utility. If you 
perceive that there's a risk of you becoming infected, um, that decreases your utility, and therefore you're incentivized to decrease your level of contact. And so that there's kind of a trade-off going on here between wanting to make contacts to gain utility, but that you might um, become infected, and so you, so you would um, be incentivized to decrease your contacts. Okay, so if we plug that utility, if we solve that utility function um, for its peak, because it's a negative quadratic, and we put that back into this it plus one term, we get this equation. And one of the things about this, um, this equation and how it's iterated is that it produces an equilibrium. This is a disease-free equilibrium, so in this case, you start at a particular level of infected people, and it goes to zero. Nothing happens, essentially. Or you have a, a, another equilibrium that's at some, uh, determined by a set of parameters in their combination, and that's a certain number, and that's a stable equilibrium, and so you will tend towards that. The reason why you might see an equilibrium is because at high levels of, of incidence, people are more incentivized to change their behavior. And this affects the epidemic. These two things interact, and, and we get to an equilibrium where everything's um, in balance. However, interestingly, if you, um, uh, if you change these parameters, if you nudge them, um, they, are, they are sensitive to, to small levels of changes in, in, in initial conditions. So there's a, several different classes of qualitatively different dynamics you can reach by changing these parameters. You see in A, that's your convergence to disease-free equilibrium. In B, that's your simple convergence to the other equilibrium. In C, you have an oscillating convergence to an equilibrium, and in D, you can lead to, uh, you can have chaotic dynamics. And that's because the system doesn't quite know where it's at. It's responding to conditions that are no longer true, and so it's out of sync, and it can never quite find its, um, its synchronization. Okay, so I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna just wrap this up. What's interesting about this model is there is an equilibrium. That's interesting. Um, it's not really for prediction. We're looking at, we're looking phenomenologically what comes out when we isolate the system. Um, a simple set of deterministic equations can produce cyclic dynamics. That's also interesting because typically we think of those cycles that happen in um, our um, epidemic curves um, are more things like demographics, births and deaths, or, or seasonality. Okay, I'm just gonna wrap up there. I'm not gonna do my concluding points, um, but I think we should move to questions now. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. A lot of the communities are um, simple, uh, small, agricultural agricultural based. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think in these communities are different. Yeah, I mean, so the city of Tubbenburg, like, there's commerce there. You know, there's shops and so on, but um, there's no like big industry in those areas. Um, I was wondering why you thought hand washing stuck as a behavior that has continued to some degree, and specifically how much of it has to do with the infrastructure is now there, either at household or institutional level. Yeah, so um, what people said in the focus group discussions about um, hand washing was that there was low awareness of that, it, that it's a good idea in general um, beforehand, and that there was low access to resources beforehand. And now people are um, more interested in con con um, um, continuing to wash their hands even after um, Ebola has gone away because it was perceived as not just um, a good measure against Ebola, but also just a good hy hygiene measure in general. And so there's a greater awareness and desire to wash hands. And the Ebola buckets that were um, made and distributed all over the country are still around. Um, Lily and I have used them, right, Lily? And so people still use those buckets. Um, uh, it was interesting to see when you mentioned your survey, you found that people had a higher level of trust with the NGO. Is that something that, you know, some studies have suggested, especially in developing countries, um, South Asia, Africa, Western Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, that 
you know, failure of foreign uh, aid projects and you know, similar interventions have led to a negative perception of NGOs. So I thought this was interesting. What were your thoughts on that? Or like, was that something that people ever connected? Or? Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting too because there were um, mistakes made by the international community and um, chiefly that a lot of the help that arrived arrived quite late. And so I would have thought that caused some distress. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that it's if you, you put yourself in the shoes of an individual, there is something about sort of the um, the there's a there's a greater degree in trust in in these institutions that come in with expensive equipment and fancy cars, and that they're there also incentivized. Um, they're not they don't have those corrupt incentives that were that the government was perceived them. So I think a lot of it has to do with those incentives. Um, or perceived incentives that, hey, why are these people here? They're here to help us, um, as opposed to the government. You know, they're doing this um, just for the money. So that's my guess. Right. You talked about the kind of the perception of the government of potentially corrupt, but I mean, is, are they right about that? Like, was that any kind of, like either way, or like, do they have good reasons to achieve that? Yeah. So specifically about Ebola. Um, there is a sort of growing level of discontent about what happened with the Ebola funds, but we don't know all the details um, in that. We do know that there are major corruption scandals ongoing now in Liberia. There was um, a, a shipment. So they produced their cash off uh, in other countries, right? I think it was in Europe. And this big boat full of Liberian dollars in cash um, went missing. And so just millions of millions of dollars just went completely missing. And so th this is now an ongoing issue and scandal. Um, corruption has been an issue since the civil wars. And so, yeah, the perception of the government has always been a little shaky. Um, can you explain how you think the measuring trust towards the government and the or trust towards the Yeah, the specific question was, um, to what degree did you trust the Liberian government and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's administration to protect your health during the uh, during this time period? It's interesting that the same community had lower trust in both. Do you have any sense for why that is? Yeah. So um, the question is why was the community in Tubmanburg with the high incidence um, seemed to have a greater level of decrease in trust over time. Um, yes, I, I think that it has everything to do with the Ebola incidents. And the reason why I think that is because some of the other things that were significantly different about that community did not uh, crop up as significant in the regression that we did. Um, I think that it's a really scary thing for um, an epidemic to come through a community. And it's also scary for the outbreak control efforts to come through. So you know, you have people in um, PPE, the personal protective equipment, and there's basically spacesuits, and there's just a lot of fear and mistrust around that. And I think, in general, too, there's 250 cases in that community, and maybe it has something to do with, you know, why are people continuing to get sick? Um, why isn't the government doing something to stop this? Um, and so I, I think you know trust continues to decrease as things continue to get worse. But it's a complex issue. It's really yeah, you know, it's hard to get up. Could you explain or could you share with us what you think the implications of uh, adding the behavioral component to the SIS modeling, um, what that has, I guess, for the future of the field? Um, sure. Yeah, let's let's go back and look at that. Um, so when you when you allow behavior to be adaptive and you introduce um, introduce that into the model, um, you see that um, that that things have kind of a that behavior change has a negative pull on the epidemic. So if we go back to our analogy of the rocket that we fire in space. Um, we don't just fire a rocket into space with an initial velocity and it just goes out. There is a gravitational pull on it. And so 
in kind of you know straining that analogy to its limits, um, we can think of that behavior change as that you know pulling on it. Um, so there's two implications of that. One is that big scary epidemics are self-limiting. So something like Ebola is big, it's scary, and big scary things lead to big in proportion reactions. So the the bigger and scarier it is, the more it's going to get pulled down. On the other hand, to use the rocket analogy again, if there's enough initial velocity, thing can go out of orbit, and it doesn't matter that the Earth's gravitational pull is pulling on it because there's so much initial velocity. So if something's big and scary enough and it transmits real quick, um, that could get out of control with our ability um, to bring the R naught down. But it doesn't just that we should over emphasize, like, we should get everyone scared fast. <laughs> yeah, so, sure. Um, fear is a major um, part of what causes behavior change. The problem is that when there's a lot of fear, there's behavior, and there's not a lot of trust, there's a lot of behavior changes that we don't want. People will run away from their community, um, even when they're sick, and that will cause things to spread faster. And, and um, fear without the trust component is actually probably an unbalanced negative. But that leads to sort of psychological, um, like health psychology models that, that um, look a lot about at exactly how much fear do we want to instill. And if we want to like, you know, have people stop smoking, for example, do we want to get them real scared about about um, cancer and tobacco? Or do we want to make them feel like they are strong individuals that can, that can change their behavior and, and you know, live longer? So it's, a, it's an interesting point. Um, OK, so I want to do some acknowledgments because I think we're about at a few minutes un until time. Is that OK with you? Um, first, I want to thank my uh, amazing committee. Um, I met uh, Jamie. When I was interviewing at Stanford, is that right, Jamie, or did we meet before that? Yeah, when I was interviewing, all of the interviews that I did were um, questions like, why Stanford? Why do you want to come to Stanford? Like, what is the nature of your research, and how will Stanford help you? Um, um, you know, like, what are you going to do once you get here? And, and Jamie was like, oh, I see you're interested in geography and math and complex systems. Check this out. And they pulled this stuff out on his com computer, and it was these, like, I think it was a dengue model that was like allowing mobility to happen. I don't even remember because I was doing this like crazy interview phase. I was just like, that guy's cool and has amazing ideas. And that held true throughout all, uh, all of my years here at Stanford. Jamie has, um, we've always had an, a great intellectual connection that way. Um, I want to thank Mark Feldman. Um, Mark and I sat with pencil and paper for countless uh, drafts and redrafts of, of one of my chapters. And I will remember specifically that um, there was this, I was trying to do the stability analysis, and I just couldn't do it. And I said, Mark, I'm pretty sure this is you know, impossible. And so he took a look at it, and um, he solved it. And then he, he put it on my desk, and he's like, I think I solved it. Why don't you go check to see if it's right? You know? And so like, I took it to a park bench, and I was like, Reproduced it, and I was like, "Oh, he's right." And that was kind of that was just a fun sort of eureka moment. Um, I want to thank Steve Luby, who um, made all of the work in Liberia possible, um, and not only that, um, was it was an important mentor to me here at Stanford um, through his class, through TAing with him, and through our monthly meetings. And I also want to thank Julio Deleo, who's um, connected through Zoom and Julie Parsonet, who were really generous with their time, not only for today, but um, Julie took um, a lot of her time to teach me in a directed reading a few years ago, and Julio took his time to contribute to our online course, and so I really appreciate that. Um, I want to recognize our amazing EIPER staff, especially Anne-Marie, Sue, Anjana, and Gabby. Um, one of the challenges of being an EIPER student is that you have two advisors in two different departments. And that is key to all of our work. This creates the interdisciplinarity. The issue is that it creates a whole host of obstacles and challenges. And you are intellectually isolated in some ways. And it is very difficult. And so you have to kind of be a self-starter. You've got to connect things. And um, 
you got to work at Stanford in a way that's really, really, really challenging. And so we couldn't do it without our um, amazing <laughs> leadership here at EI First. So thank you guys so much. Um, I want to say a brief thank you to all the mentors that have gotten me to where I am today. Specifically, um, Jared Diamond, who as an undergrad was like the first person to treat me as somebody who might have an intellectually interesting thing to say. Um, Steve Lansing, who I met with in Stockholm, who forwarded me to Lisa Curran, who told me about EIPER, and uh, Lisa and Jamie, who, who got me really excited about the program and got, and got me to come here. I um, also want to say thanks to Bill Durham, Matt Bonds, um, and Peter Vitusik um, for helping me along the way. Um, not always through um, specific academic things, but sometimes just for, through having a beer and, and asking me how it's going and, and giving me some advice. Um, there were some research partners that welcomed me into the field um, to work with them internationally. Um, Steve Lansing, Jan, and Laura helped, um, welcomed me to work with them in Bali, Argentina, Uganda, respectively. But especially um, Lily Horn, who's in the back, um, she really led our efforts in Liberia. And um, she's a great friend of mine. But it's a particular kind of friendship that develops when you live with somebody, you share an apartment in Monrovia during the rainy season, and uh, you go and play ultimate frisbee together at the Department of Defense like lawn. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of unique situations that you get yourself into. You get to know the person on a on a on a really deep level, and um, she's been so generous and kind to me. Um, the broader Stanford intellectual community, especially the Jones Lab, Feldman Lab, and uh, Luby Lab. And I won't mention everybody because I'm definitely out of time. But um, and also the different centers that I was a part of um, were, were super helpful in shaping my ideas and the way I think. Um, I have the best cohort: uh, Eleanor, Emily, Michael, Laura, uh, Stacy, and uh, Ciders, and our honorary cohort member Hayden, who you can see here. She's the 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 little one in the in the front. Um, we had some. Fantastic partners in Liberia. I want to specifically thank the University of Liberia, Liberian Institute of Biomedical Research, the Ministry of Health, Dr. Bole, Dominic, Dr. George, Valentine, Cornelius, Alpha Simpson, but specifically this man here in the red, um, that's Amos Tanipoli, who was instrumental, to say the least, in doing everything we did. He came with us on, um, on our trips to visit each community. He embedded the ideas of specific communities to, to work in. And um, he was always available to, um, to travel all over. <laughs> we went to Carysburg together, to Tubmanburg together. Um, and he's, he was a really steadfast component to this whole research. I have a big, great network of friends that um, are really supportive and helpful. Um, especially, I want to point out Fran more who um, helped me since I got to Stanford from uh, choosing classes to qualifying to the defense. Um, and then Ross Burnett, who's, who is in the center there, who went through a knitting phase at that time, who's been a great friend of mine for a long time. And uh, my wonderful family, my parents, my uh, brothers and sisters, niece and nephew, um, thank you guys so much. You've been really influential and supportive. And last but not least, uh, Liz Lowe, who um, it is very difficult to go through your last six months of your PhD and tie everything together. It's even more difficult to um, be in a relationship with someone doing that. So uh, that was a Herculean effort. Thank you, Liz. And then I also want to thank some funders, especially Dan and Rick Emmett and the NSF.